So now I have the pleasure to turn it over to Jeff Johnson and Michelle Cooper from the Oregon chapter to talk through all the technology pieces to streaming that Tracy was talking about a little bit earlier. So thank awesome. you everyone. Thank Good you. morning. Good morning. I'm gonna share my screen here to make sure we bring up our PowerPoint. And hope, hopefully everyone can see my screen yep. and hear me just fine. So yep. um, we were given just a few minutes to join you wonderful presidents and we are honored to be part of the program today. Michelle and I have worked long and hard with the Oregon chapter to do a little bit more. I take advantage of everything we can as far as technology goes to bring the best experience to our members. So we just wanted to share some of the things that we've learned along the way, some of the gotchas that we find out there, and of course, answer any questions that you may have. So with that, my name is Jeff Johnson, and on with me is... Michelle Cooper. Uh, nice to be with you all, thank you. Um, oh, that's us. Um, so today they asked us to review a little bit more about just the technology itself, equipment requirements, if there are any, and of course, the best methods of live streaming. So with that, we'll jump right into our agenda. So reviewing the technology that's out there, um, this goes from Dropbox to YouTube, from Zoom to Teams, identifying what's best for your chapter. There's a lot that is being made available to organizations today. Um, as you know, these are probably some of the top platforms that you use daily when you're interacting mm -hmm. with either your clients or, or in different environments. Obviously, for many HFMA chapters, we've opted to go with Zoom because that's what the association has chosen and they've provided some great pricing for us. There are other platforms though, and we just wanted to make you aware of that because one of those platforms and their features may actually meet your needs as a chapter better than Zoom, depending on what you're doing. So it's always good. Um, there is a reference in the slide where you can go and look and see how the different platforms compare to each other and some of the features that they have. It's always good to be shopping around too, based on what you're doing so that your chapter and your members are getting the best experience, whether it be online or whether it be partially in person and also online. Michelle, do you have anything to add? Um, I think the only thing to be aware of is, and Jeff's listed both of them off, but there be as you're setting up different components and as you're considering different platforms, make sure you understand the difference between their meeting platform and their webinar platform. Because depending on what you intend to do, one may work better than the other. So like if you want um, breakout sessions, you're going to need, you know, to go with different platform than if you're just doing presenting or if you want to be able to see people uh, like in this combination, you're going to have options and want to have that as part of your consideration. So know who is speaking and know what their goals are. Yeah, that's probably the biggest thing that's been the gotcha for our chapter is we get down the path, we set up a webinar thinking it's going to be this big webinar and we're meeting with the presenter a few days before and they really say, no, I really want to see everyone's face and I want them to talk. <laughs> and then suddenly we're sending out a new link to try to do a meeting versus a webinar. So like Michelle said, that discussion with your presenters well in advance is really key. Mm -hmm. um, obviously we have chosen this, just a couple of um, benefits that we've found over GoToMeeting. We used to be on GoToMeeting as a chapter um, before the association found the great pricing through Zoom. Um, but the benefits of Zoom over GoToMeeting, they have the breakout rooms, which are so um, easy and fun for people to use. And we're not really finding that in any of the other platforms right now. And of course, multiple recording levels. Um, in other packages, what you'll find is they record just a flat thing. You have options in Zoom to record many different things from just the presenter's face to just the audio to all the discussion points that happen in the chats, and that's great. Uh, one thing that we were hoping for that we haven't seen in Zoom so far is 
a go to meeting had certificates available that they would automatically mail out. Um, mm -hmm. So we weren't relying on someone to go back and mail out your participation and stuff like that. But um, we're, we're accommodating that through the Zoom. But just know there are some different options on the different platforms. We also want to talk about content storage and sharing. Thank you so much, Brianna, for touching on the HFA community free storage because that's huge for all of us. I don't know if you're out there working with your organization, but when you're sharing content, you do those presentations, you want that to be advantageous for the people who maybe weren't able to participate during your meeting, but are, are your members. And so our chapter is actually, um, we use Dropbox just to share stuff internally. And now we're using, we're slowly migrating over to the free storage with the HFMA community. And, um, when we're done, we're providing that content to all of our members for future use using either YouTube or, of course, um, or our website itself, Oregon HFMA. Um, so we have a couple of gotchas, and Michelle was going to talk about those when it comes to utilizing Dropbox and yeah. YouTube. So um, we also push out the content. So we post it to YouTube, we post it to the website. We also push it out to the social media so that we're trying to reach the, uh, particularly the younger members are, you know, in many, many ways, just enmeshed in the social media world. So the way we can reach them is pushing out st uh, information to Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram, et cetera. Um, one of the gotchas we figured out with Dropbox though, was if you are, paying for a, a business and what they call a, a enterprise license in Dropbox, which is only $45 a month. So it's really, you know, not a bad price. However, if you share that Dropbox with a person who has a personal Dropbox, it will quickly max out their memory availability. So your personal Dropbox have a limited amount of available space. And so you're, if you're paying for one, it's got a lot more um, available space. So just be aware of that uh, when you're making the decision what platforms to use. With YouTube, uh, we found out the hard way that depending on how you're logged in, if you're still logged into like the YouTube account and you do a search for personal, because I wanna go see the most recent Taylor Swift videos, um, yeah, that will now populate your uh, HFMA windows. So if somebody logs in, opens up YouTube and looks at Oregon HFMA and somebody has done a search, um, it will be amazingly apparent what has been searched for. So just be aware of that and make sure you're logging out of your YouTube, uh, your HFMA YouTube before you go searching for information. Thank you, Michelle. It's so true. <laughs> Um, so I just quickly wanted to jump over, if it's okay, to our YouTube channel, just so you guys can see how we're utilizing that. And this is our YouTube channel today. Uh, hopefully you guys can see that. But it just shows all of the videos and the content. And so it's a great place for our, our members to come and see some of the stuff that we've been sharing, past education, if they want to sit down with their teams. We have quite a few videos out here. Um, they can continue that education. Now we know that obviously that doesn't count um, towards CPEs and stuff like that. If they go back and watch it after it has to be live, but it's still a great resource. And we just wanted to show you how we're utilizing YouTube to continue to educate our members even after the fact. Um, so um, a little bit more on just the platforms and the technology itself and how we're utilizing that in Oregon. Um, we're use, uh, utilizing it obviously like other chapters for that chapter education for these events that are happening for regional events as well. Um, we're participating there. Chapter networking events are really important, but we have found so many different games and pushing stuff live and finding great success in sharing that through the online media. We also have what we call our, our problem solving, so it actually become a really big por portion of what Oregon HFMA offers, but we do have all the hospitals that get together and they just have, we have a session that's free to everyone in the entire community, regardless of where you're at, where you can come in and hear what these leaders are thinking and doing and dealing with. Um, and that happens every month, which has been very big and important. Mm -hmm. Michelle talked about the social media pushes. We have chapter podcasts and something unique that our chapter president wanted to do, Tammy Kuhn, this year is have it not only 
a podcast, but we also go ahead and we put that on YouTube. And we've noticed that since we've also included the video of us talking, our hits have gone up dramatically. More and more people are engaged with that and we're getting great feedback. So just some F FYI on that. Um, of course, vendor recognition is huge and we are playing stuff before and after and we're, put, we're tying that into all of the media that we produce um, so that they're getting that extra recognition, of course, and member engagement. So this is the what, this is what we just talked about. This is how we're doing it. Um, these are some of the tools that we're using. I won't go over each one, but you guys can see them there. And of course, this presentation is being made available to you. So if you want to go back and reference any of the slides, you may. The one thing, Jeff, before you jump forward, I do want to push up, mention Buffer, because that was kind of, that is a really cool functionality for the social media. If you are lazy like I am, and I don't really want to have to log into every single social media account to push out a, uh, a public, you know, an announcement or social uh, video or something like that. You can use Buffer to actually push out to multiple social media platforms at the same time. You can also schedule them in the future. So if you have five that you want to go out over the next, you know, 10 days, one every other day, you can schedule them in such a fashion. So Buffer is something worth looking into, if, particularly if you're using multiple social media platforms. Awesome. Thank you. So we have a best practice out there that we guys, you guys can look at. Um, I think the most important thing is just, like Michelle said before, know. Know what you're dealing with in your chapter. Know where you want to take the education and then set things up appropriately and take the time to do it and test and test and test and test a million times before you go live with your members just to make it the best experience. Um, we know that security is also very important and we know that Zoom has put in those security protocols for us. Um, but always keep that in mind as you go to put that together. Um, hardware also becomes very important and we're going to share it during this session. Michelle's going to kick us off just talking about leveraging um, the hardware and we're going to show both what we're doing today, which are these online meetings and the hardware that you need, but also taking us through what happens when we go back as a chapter and we're meeting in person. What are those tools that we need to make sure that we can continue to use this technology and um, have the hardware to support it? So we'll move into that. Yeah, so, um, you know, one of the biggest things that we find not only for online, but even in person, is you really need hard internet connections. Wi-Fi is amazing and really useful in a lot of situations, but for streaming and things like where you're trying to do online webinars or online meetings, a hard connection is much more stable. Um, just think about the bingo game of how many times everyone fills the square of I lost my Wi-Fi connection and I had to shift or I had to wait for it to reboot. So um, hard wires are really beneficial. You also really need two people running the event. Um, you really need somebody to manage the presenter, do the polling, you know, do the sponsorship videos, uh, all of that, and somebody to watch the chat. So like I've been responding to a couple of the chats while Jeff has been talking. So you really need somebody to fill that role. Um, so just making sure that you are looking at the, you know, participants looking at and have kind of all of that covered as part of the online equipment requirements. And if Jeff advances the slide, we can talk about in-person uh, requirements also, I think, is the next slide. Yeah. Um, before you go, I just wanted to mention, I know a lot of us are using those breakouts in Zoom, which are really great. But something that we've learned as a chapter is really make sure you know that the, if you tell the participants that a speaker is going to be doing the breakout, just so they know that I probably need an audio tool to communicate mm -hmm. if we're doing the breakout. We've had situations where people didn't know that breakouts were going to occur. They go into a breakout room, they don't even have an audio device to talk, so they're trying to chat to people. And it's just not the same when you're in a breakout and you can't engage with the audio and the video. So letting your members know that that's gonna occur and that if they can, it's best to have the audio on is really important. So we just wanted to share that. Uh, so we already talked about the hard connection. Um, these are, this is just a list. I'm not gonna go through all of these different components. Um, there's a much more detailed presentation that Jeff and I did that I think Tracy can make available. Um, but, you know, making sure you have a table to put your equipment, video camera, dongle, we'll look at the next slide and which actually gives you what we purchased. Um, and all of this is actually stored in my office or my garage in some fashion. Um, we wireless mics. So you do end up having to purchase a wireless mic that plugs into your computer 
this is so then when the speaker is actually starting to speak in an in-person event they will have the honor of wearing two different mics one will be for the room one will be for the computer uh, and then we also gave information here on what the dongles are that we were able to purchase uh, be sure you know what kind of computer you're going to be plugging that dongle into because it makes a difference uh, and a camcorder tripod um, all of that information in light of time I'm not going to spend a great deal of time um, but the biggest uh, thing to be aware of, I believe, on the next slide is don't go cheap. You know, we, we, we made the mistake of trying to purchase a cheaper cam camera at one point to save money, and we returned it twice before we finally just spent the money to buy a better camera. So just be aware that, you know, going cheap doesn't necessarily save you money. You also can look at vendors. You know, we all have amazing vendors and sponsors who help us and looking to one of those who might be willing to help sponsor the fees that are associated with the equipment purchases is one way that you can help to uh, finance purchasing the equipment. And remember, you're not purchasing the equipment every single year. You know, you can purchase it and then you can move on. Uh, in the bigger presentation, there's also comments. Uh, be sure that you are thinking about how many rooms do we usually take up when we're meeting in person. So if you have uh, breakout sessions and you have two breakout sessions, you need two sets of camera equipment. So be aware that you kind of think ahead and think forward to what, how do we set up our in-person events so that you can determine how much equipment you really need to purchase. Thank you, Michelle. And what's so great about having this equipment available, when we go back into that environment where we have our presenters who are in front of an audience, but we still have half of our chapter who's sitting online because we still will have that, this is a way to reach both audiences, right? You, you're in front of them, but you're still streaming and you're creating the same environment for the people that are online as the people in person are having. And so that's why this becomes important. And of course, it's very affordable. I think if you go back and look at some of these numbers, that's not an extreme amount. And yet it's something that's very doable for chapters. Um, and having practiced it across with other chapters, brought my equipment and done it, it's very easy to learn and implement as well. So if you have any questions on that, let us know. We're happy mm -hmm. to walk you through it. I wanna talk a little bit more about this live streaming methodology to ensure that positive experience for everyone who's online. And here's some of the things that we have learned. So it really comes down to that speaker. Speaker requirements are so important. And like we mentioned before, that practice, practice, practice with your speakers is important. There will be tons of presenters who tell you they're very comfortable doing the online presentations, <laughs> but they do it all the time. And then you start walking through the practice session and you see that their eyes get big and they're like, wait, I can do what? And it opens up um, great discussion for you as a chapter in preparing them and of course preparing the presentation as well knowing to, when to kick a pole live whether or not they want to use mentimeter because they want a more open discussion um, with the group or whether or not they're fine with just a multiple choice polling at the end of the day again um, we've been caught multiple times by a presenter who suddenly changed their mind and wanted breakout rooms but we had a webinar set up well you can't do a breakout room in a webinar. You can only do a breakout room in a meeting. So then we're changing, we're trying to send new links out to everybody and that's just not the best experience. So I can't stress enough and weeks in advance, sitting down with your presenters, making that mandatory to walk through, make sure that you're comfortable, they're comfortable um, to provide that best experience. Another thing, um, obviously our presenters have to sign off that they agree to be recorded that their content will become part of our content. Um, Michelle talked about if it is in person, they have to be willing to wear two microphones. That means you, you want to let them know in advance. You want to, uh, someone to show up in a beautiful outfit with no pockets, trying to figure out where they're going to hang two lavaliers off of themselves. Uh, so having that communication again in advance, mm -hmm. super important. I will say that if, if we do end up back in a live environment where we're also streaming, super important to talk to the audience and let them know that it is being streamed so that they don't walk in front of the cameras or, or maybe make noise that they wouldn't normally want heard online. The other, oh, sorry, Jeff. The other thing from that slide, you know, um, is make sure that your presenters are sending you the presentations in a PowerPoint format. 
A lot of presenters like to convert their PowerPoints to PDF just to protect the, you know, protect editing and things like that. That does not stream well at all. So um, a PowerPoint is a much better option, which seems somewhat intuitive, but you'd be amazed at how many times we end up with a PDF being emailed to us. And then we have to go back and say, no, we really need a PowerPoint. So just be aware of that. Excellent point. We included in here the contract that the Oregon HFMA uses to have all of our speakers sign and agree to everything. If, they, if they're not willing to do this, we typically will not invite them to present at our chapter just because we need that experience to be great for those who are online as well as those who are present. So um, feel free to copy that if you want to, but this is what we use. Um, so just some best requirements, best practices again, coordinate with everybody within the chapter. Make sure your CBIN administrator is on board as well. And of course, practice, 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 practice a million times. They say that you should always start your presentation 15 minutes in advance. We actually do that so that we can show all of our vendors who are supporting and having that run through. So as people are joining, they're actually seeing the vendors over and over and over and over again. Something to keep in mind. Um, you may want to implement if you're not doing that already. Um, so I think we've gone through most of these. Michelle, do you have any other things to add on live streaming best practices? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, the one question that did come up is how do we handle speakers requesting to make content available for themselves? And so I think we can touch on that um, during the Q&A, but that kind of falls into this part too. Yeah. No, that's great. Um, I can answer that right now. I mean, right now what our chapter is doing to make the content available back to the speaker, we actually do editing on the videos. And so it ends up being a nice little piece for them to own as a speaker. But we, we put the link out there on our YouTube page and they're able to go there. They're able to send people there, even on their websites, they're able to link back to that YouTube presentation. In some situations, we have allowed them to take that video and we've provided it to them. They're putting it on their website, but they have to leave it edited the way that we do. So it's branded with Oregon HFMA. They have to leave that branding in place because um, that was done at our chapter and part of that agreement. So that's what we're doing currently. We haven't had any pushback, mm -hmm. which is great. And um, it does help the impressions that we get on YouTube, which is good. And it, it just gives more info, or more notoriety to the chapter. Sorry. So with that, we have a whole bunch of extra slides, by the way, a whole bunch of detail um, that's behind this slide here with great content that uh, we're going to provide, but we just didn't have time to go into it yeah. in the session. So some of the questions that have come up in the chat, um, website platform and maintenance, uh, we use uh, Bluehost is our hosting, and then um, WordPress is our platform that it is built on. Um, as far as maintenance, we do, we, one of the slides is buried later in after this one, is uh, that we converted our communications team to a technology and communications team. So that team is actually who is responsible for maintaining the website, the social media, doing the video, doing the live streaming. Um, you know, doing all sorts of that kind of stuff. So that's really kind of how we set it up. Um, One thing, you, go ahead. One thing I'll add to that, Michelle, sorry, uh, is that that's a great way to capture a lot of the younger generation mm -hmm. and, and bring them in is having them participate in the technology committee. They have the expertise. Um, so you have to work with them on a couple of things, but for the most part, they're really great and they bring many awesome ideas. So I do recommend that technology committee in every chapter. Yeah. Um, so, and we do use Cvent. So uh, even with the uh, live streaming and the people who are registering to be watching it at home, when we also do in-person events, we all we do use Cvent so that we have a record of attendance uh, for across the board. We have slides also that are showing how we integrate Cvent into this process using Zoom and everything. And those are part of the slide deck that we're not going to present today. Uh, let's see. And then one of the questions was uh, uh, the interaction or networking between attendees that are in person with attendees that are in participating virtually in the breakout rooms. 
I will be honest, that is one of the areas we have not mastered. Um, we, you know, very much, we've got breakout rooms for people now that we're doing all virtual, uh, but we really had not, we, we acknowledged that it was an issue, but we had not really tackled and figured out a way to have networking between uh, people who were in person and people who were online. Right. So, so that is certainly something we need to work on. Yeah. What we've done to compensate is while we're, while it's going on in live, we're actually taking the camera and we are zooming in on the different conversations so that people online can see the groups chatting. And then we are sharing after, of course, what's being said online with those in the room. So that's what the technology committee does, shares with the presenter and that what's being said online while also zooming around with the camera. That's why you have that tripod to try to capture what's also happening in the room. It's not a perfect solution, but that's what we've done to date to try to bring them together. Things that we're considering doing for LTC is having someone with a laptop, you know, a, a connected to Zoom at each like area, even though we're not in like a round table area, but having a laptop available so you can have that engagement with the individuals and putting that breakout room at the table itself. So there are ways, and now you would have to have a laptop, you know, in let, let, let's say you have five breakout rooms, you would have to have those available. However, most people are traveling with them and then they just need the Zoom connection um, to be able to participate in that, you know, round table um, per se. So there, there are there are workarounds. Um, it does take coordination, and you know, like Jeff said, practice, practice, practice. I can't um, reemphasize that enough. Um, but great information. I do have a. I totally lost my train of thought. I had a question about um, when you guys are like. Now everything's virtual. When we go back, there's going to be that component where people are wanting to be engaged and interactive. And you know the breakout rooms are one thing. When you're moving around, Jeff, have you guys considered a 360 camera? Only because we're looking at that for like a networking where the camera just does it on its own. Or do you recommend having that Zoom feature? Has that been good feedback that people can actually get closer and then go away? I'm just curious. Uh, we Michelle and I did talk about the 360 camera, but we weren't sure how to implement it, depending yeah, okay. on the room. So. Um, Right now, what we're doing is just manually zooming in. So we have someone running the camera mm -hmm. the entire time. Okay. And zooming in and out. But that's a great thought, Tracy. It's a great thought. And, and the uh, one, as you're looking at cameras, one thing to think about is um, you have to, the camera has to be capable not only of live streaming, but also recording at the same time. Um, so some cameras are out there will do one or the other, but they won't do both simultaneous. So making sure that the camera you purchase is one that can do accomplish both goals. And Michelle has offered to send me the Amazon links for yeah. those um, things. So I will put those with the um, speaker resources that we talked about earlier and put all the Amazon links together. So we'll have that. And Michelle and Jeff will be more than happy to share their deck with us as well so we can populate that in the community. Um, you know, so it's a reference after the fact. Yes, in fact, you have it. So that's good. Yeah, I have it. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Michelle and I are also happy to join any chapter if you're trying to implement it and you have some ideas or you just are trying to figure things out and you want us to meet with your team. I'd be happy to show you, uh, do a hands-on with them. So mm -hmm. whatever works. And we can't thank um, these two enough. They, they were um, awesome at LTC, awesome today, awesome every other day of the year. <laughs> um, so thank you guys um, for, you know, your participation and willingness to share. I think that, um, you know, it, it, you guys have been doing this for a while and definitely the leaders across the, the organization. So um, like I said, I can't thank you guys enough for, for helping with these um, presentations. Well, thank you for having us. You, yeah. And may the force be with everyone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>